The importance of livestock in habitat management is becoming increasingly clear. Goats and cattle are now often used for conservation grazing. Pigs are used to eat up things like acorns that can be a problem for things like new forest ponies, but also to turn over the land so they get it ready for new fertility and new plantings. Behind us, you can see what happens when chickens are confined in a wooded area. But we're going to do something really interesting with that area. Join us and see what we're up to. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to our woodland garden area. Welcome on a beautiful spring day to establishing a grassland habitat. I'm gonna apologize in advance. You may be able to hear chainsaws behind me. That's our neighbor farmers cutting up their harvested wood for next year's winter heat. Ramesses, our stud cockerel, is definitely feeling spring, so he'll be crowing at us on occasions. The birds are singing, and there's a new foal in the field on that side, whinnying to our mum every now and again. So all nature is out enjoying the spring, and why not? Regular viewers to the channel will know that over winter and early spring, we've had an avian influenza outbreak here. And that's resulted in grazed off areas where we've kept our chickens under netted cover to keep them safe from wild birds that could infect them. We could just reseed that with standard utility grass, move on, get on with our lives. But we're not going to. Something we don't talk about perhaps as much as we should on this channel is we try to do whatever we can on the small holding to increase species and biodiversity, to bring wildlife into our lives. And as much as that is lovely, so for example, we tolerate the voles that sometimes get at our strawberries because we love to see the barn owls that live on the voles. But there's much more to it than that. There are bats in the area and people might say, well, that's great, but so what? Well, bats eat thousands of insects. And when you live in the flatlands, insects can become a problem. And I genuinely believe that if you encourage nature into your lives, it finds a balance and nothing gets wildly out of proportion, where you get plagues of insects or mice or what have you. If you've got the owls around, the mice are much less likely to get out of control. So that's part of what we're trying to achieve as well. It's a good balance of nature. And to do that, rather than just have monocultures everywhere, what we're trying to do is have mixed native hedgerows with 20 or 30 species in. And that will provide food for birds. It will provide refuge for mammals. It gives hedgehogs a way to get through rather than tight board fences. It provides all manner of opportunity. So here with our grazed off area where there was utility grass, we've got a fantastic opportunity to do something a little bit more exciting. And we're going to reseed that with six or seven different species of native grasses that are properly shade tolerant, the right species for using in a woodland. And we're going to let that come up. We're just going to have a little path through it and we're going to let it all get tall so that you've got seed heads for the birds to eat. You've got shade areas for amphibians. The insects can be in amongst it and it will really promote a wider range of habitats on the small holding. This is what I'm going to grow. This is from Emma's Gate Seeds. It's their EG9 mixture. And their EG9 mixture is designed to have grass seed that is suitable for woodland, for hedgerows, for that semi-shaded environment. There's seven different grass seeds in here. And some of them have the most beautiful seed heads. And that alone is going to really improve my outlook. I'm also going to add loads of my favourites. And I'm going to be a little bit sort of, you know, personal about it. So I'm going to put cowslips in because, oh my goodness, cowslips are beautiful. I'm going to put foxglove in because I love foxglove. I'm going to put field scabious in, beautiful purple flowers. And they attract so many insects. And being really greedy, I'm going to put teasel in. Teasel is this massive kind of thistle-like structural plant with these big round seed heads. And interestingly, teasel, teasel seed heads, try saying that quickly, used to be used to card wool a long time ago, but they did. But you know what they're also great for? Finches. Goldfinches love teasel seed. They adore it. 
So if I plant some teasel, I'll get even more of our local goldfinches in our garden singing their beautiful hearts out on a summer's day. But we've got some work to do. This is dry as a bone and it's packed completely hard. So I've got to sort that out. It's also far more uneven than it appears on camera. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break up the surface. I'm going to use a rotivator because I've got one. If I didn't, I'd just use a soil rake and a fork and break this surface up a little bit. Then I'm going to flatten it out and I'll do that by raking it out as best I can. I may even run a board over it which kind of knocks off the tops of the hills and pushes them into the valleys. And that'll give me some sort of seed bed. I'm not going for bowling green, I'm really not. But I want it a little bit fatter than it is right now. Then I'll use a spreader to spread grass seed evenly right across the bed and I'll rake that in. And I'll put in my flower seeds by hand because I don't want them necessarily evenly distributed. I want a little patch of cowslips over here and then further back into the deep shade I might have some teasels. So I'm going to sort of almost design that a little bit. So I will put them in by hand. Once I put all my seeds in, rake them in to mix them with the soil and I'm going to run a garden roller over them to compress them in to make sure they don't blow away or get eaten by birds and then I'm going to sprinkle them and we'll wait for them to germinate but I will have to keep them wet whilst waiting. Well, if you've never used a rotivator on stony ground or ground with a load of tree roots, you have no idea how hard it is to keep it going straight as it bucks around and hits various objects. And in this bucket, we've got some of the objects the rotivator brought to the surface. Now, this land, we know this particular area has been farmed since the 1600s. The place names, though, are Viking and it was inhabited before that. So there's been people here for a very long time. Most of what we found today is more modern, but come and have a look, see what we dug up. And also, by the end, you'll understand why I have to put a knife in my pocket when I'm rotivating. <laughs> so here's a small selection of what we turn up. Might be of interest. Some of it, modern and pretty prosaic. Looks like somebody's cupboard door handle and a, some sort of steel pin. At some point here, somebody either burned or rotted back a mattress or a bed. So we get bed springs from time to time. Not sure what that is, but it could be the collar of a pickaxe or a mattock, perhaps. Old strap hinges are common. Bits and pieces that have dropped off machinery over the years. Far from uncommon. So we get quite a bit of that. Pieces of brick, inevitable. But look at the thickness of that brick. It's not a modern factory brick. That's a handmade brick without a frog. We also get glass and we've turned up whole bottles from time to time from all sorts of bits and pieces, usually between 100 and 200 years old. And tiles are interesting because these don't match the quarry tiles that, which are actually older that are in the property. So where that comes from, I've no idea. Lastly, we get a lot of bone. Given the sore nature of that, I suspect that is a marrow bone from somebody's dog. But these, no, not so much. They're not dog bones at all. You wouldn't give that to your dog. But this used to be a pig farm. And we know they did on-site butchery. So I very much suggest that these are probably from that era or even 
domestic waste from an earlier era. Let me show you the last thing we get a vast amount of and why I have to put a knife in my pocket while I'm rotivating. And this is what you get when people aren't careful with baler twine. Stuff never rots, but it does love to tangle itself on rotivator blades. So one of my rotivation tools in a 300 year old property is a good sharp knife. Late afternoon's coming on now, so I better get a crack on it. I'm gonna use a grass seed spreader to spread that wonderful grass seed over the ground that we've raked out. I'm not going to put a board over it, there's too many tree roots etc to get it truly flat, but it's a lot flatter than it was. Let's take a look at that grass seed. This is our wonderful, and to be fair, not cheap, woodland hedgerow grass mix. If you look at it carefully, you can see it's in fact a blend of lots of different sizes and colours of grass seed that should give us that wonderful look of lots of different seed heads and heights. As you can see, we've got a nice, even coating of grass seed down. It's fine to spread it by hand as well if you haven't got a grass seed spreader. Next job is to rake it in. I'm only using a light rake this time just to basically mix up the grass seed so a lot of it is under the surface of the soil, but only barely so. We don't want to bury it an inch down. So a light rake over, and then we'll get on with adding in all our wildflowers. Grass seeds raked in. Next job then is I'm just going to put some of these wildflower seeds, dot them around and lightly rake those in as well. That's all our seeds sprinkled and raked lightly and now we have to firm it down. The cheapest and easiest way is just shuffle along one foot next to the other making sure that every piece of earth is trod on. It doesn't give a particularly even finish but it's cheap and accessible. If you've got a roller that gives a better finish and it is a bit quicker but it's back-breaking work. If you think they're quaint and remind you of village cricket and croquet lawns, shove one around for an hour and you'll soon learn better. But they do work, they do give a great finish. You can often pick them up for nothing as I did with that one. So, idiot power time. <laughs> We've raked it and rolled it horizontally and vertically. Now we've got a nice firm seed bed. We've got the pump on some of our gathered rainwater and we're going to get that seed bed really nice and damp and down to encourage some germination. And we'll keep it damp until that germination occurs. It's the 12th of June. I think you can tell the grass has taken absolutely beautifully. Now we're going to mow a sort of meandering path through that grass, just so it's easier to walk through, still letting all the wildflowers and mixed grasses come up either side. It's the middle of July. Things have changed a little bit. We've got a long way to go, but I hope you can start to get a sense of what we're trying to create here. And if you've got a couple of minutes, let me just give you a quick tour and show you some of the highlights of what we've already got.
There we are. Just a small step from one couple to do a little bit to improve biodiversity, to help the ecology along, and just to encourage wildlife to have a small place to go. We're not doing anything on a grand scale, and I don't claim any great knowledge. If you want to hear from somebody who I think is a real advocate for ecology, I'll put a link in the description below to the book that inspired me here, Meadowland by John Lewis Stemple. Fantastic fella, talks a lot of common sense and talks ecology on a human scale where you and I can actually get involved and do something about it. And for me, that's really, really important. I don't propose to cover lots and lots and lots of the stuff that we do on this one, but if you would like to see a bit more, let us know in the comments if you want to know more about the native hedging we've put in or what we do to ensure that the tawny minor bees have somewhere nice to live. If you've enjoyed today's video, could you spare us five seconds? Give us a thumbs up down below. And if you'd like to see more from us, then just whack on that subscribe button, the bell next to it, and you'll hear every time we upload a new video. But whatever you do, come back and see us soon. Take care.